Hey, good morning and welcome to Breakthrough Walls. I'm Ken Walls and I'm your host. And today I have Cody Garaguzlu on the show. Pretty sure I nailed that. Um, anyway, listen, do me a favor, share this out. Let's get a bunch of people on here to hear Cody's story and um, stay with us. We'll be right back. And we are back. Let me bring Cody on. Cody, welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Good to be here. Good to have you here. So I started this, um, I don't know, five and a half years ago. And um, I truly believe that in life, we learn how to win more by hearing how other people overcame hard times and won anyway. So that's what this is all about. It's breaking through walls. So um, why don't you start with telling everybody where you were born and raised? Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, so I was born in Colorado Springs, uh, Colorado. Um, was raised until I was six. We moved quickly uh, to Louisiana. Um, my dad was in the Army, so we were just bouncing around. So, um, you know, I was in Germany, then Louisiana until I was six, and then Virginia for a year, ended up in Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, from like third grade um, through high school, went to college there. What what part of Kansas? So that's the Little Apple. That's Manhattan, Kansas. Oh, the Little Apple. I've actually heard that before. So so what what was um what was it? So you you're you're considered an army brat. That's right. Yeah, Mo moving around. What was that like for you as a kid? Uh, I liked it. I really did. Um, yeah. I made friends pretty easily wherever I went, so I wasn't uh, too uh, worried about that. Although, um, you know, I did have some close friends that, uh, you know, as as usual, you know, sometimes you get separated. But yeah, yeah. So you ended up in Kansas. You said in third grade, mm -hmm. stayed there through high school. Just a regular. Uh, all American upbringing, I guess, in, in the middle of the country, Kansas. Um, what, what kind of stuff did you get into in high school? Did you play sports? Were you a brainiac? Both? Uh, I mean, I got, I got into trouble in high school. It's the kind of stuff I got into. Yeah. Wow. Um, you know, they, uh, I think high school was a little bit boring for me. Uh, and so actually, you know, with my friends, sometimes we didn't even go. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I went to, I was kind of having some, getting into a lot of trouble. I ended up in ninth grade going to Alaska, living with a friend there. Um, kind of cooled wow. down a little bit, you know, back at just the, the easy grind, getting straight A's, whatever. Um, did, did one silly thing, got kicked out of school near the end of the year. And then I was expelled for a year. So. Wow. Yeah. Had a good, uh, had a good year off. And then um, kind of got my shit together after that. Decided I wanted to do stuff and things. And that my, my current path didn't quite align with my aspirations. So it kind of turned things around. Uh, wow. So I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> At all, because I know I know we're gonna head down another path about your your education, and um, so that completely caught me off guard. Um, I, which I hey I admire it because I we're cut from that same cloth. I, I I may or may not have gotten into some trouble in high school as well. Um, so so talk talk about um, what happened after high school. And I, I, I would almost assume, and I'm probably <laughs> wrong, but I would assume that since you were raised by somebody in the army, the natural path would be to join the army. 
Uh, not really. I mean, so, okay. I mean, my dad joined the army. Um, I mean, he came from Iran in 78, right? Just before the Shah lost power, went to school in Indiana Tech, did mechanical engineering, uh, met my mom. Uh, they got married. Um, he was looking for a job. As the story goes, it was hard for the Persian people to find jobs at that time in the United States. So um, yeah. he joined the army. He was enlisted, not even an officer. So for a while there, um, you know, but uh, together with my two sisters um, and then, but he, he retired recently. So he retired full bird colonel. So he went hard through the whole thing. Yeah. About a year wow. and a half ago. So. so he had, but he had a college degree when he joined, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. And they still, he, he was enlisted, not, not an officer. No. Nope. Yep. That's right. So I think he became an officer when I was like five or six, I'm going to say. Wow. The youngest of us. Yeah. So what, what happened with you? So you, you get out, you graduate high school. Yes. Yeah. Did just fine. Graduating high school. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> the, okay. Even with a year off. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So they, uh, what happened? Where, where'd you go from there? Uh, after high school. Yeah. So yeah, I went to Kansas state university. So, um, you know, I had, uh, you know, got my stuff together pretty good, uh, by my senior year had taken some like summer classes before that to catch up some of the things I missed, get ahead even. Um, so by my first year, um, in college, you know, I started in calculus three. Um, I was taking, you know, high level engineering classes. Um, so I, I got, I got ahead actually. Um, and wow. I, I kept my foot on the on the pedal, so I was taking like twenty credit hours um, at a time. I did physics and mechanical nuclear engineering, two two bachelor's degrees in four years. Um, so I did all right by my by it there, yeah. Nothing like being an underachiever. <laughs> no, yeah. So, so okay, so let me ask you that what okay you go from getting in trouble getting expelled for a year mm -mm. graduating high school and then just going i'm gonna go get 400 degrees really quick what changed what was the big sh there had to have been a huge paradigm shift for you yeah i mean you know i think uh you know i tell well i'll tell this story this is funny but uh you know in my getting in trouble days you know sitting around with a group of uh, friends that don't necessarily always do right by you. This group of friends, you know, eventually didn't end up hanging out with most of them, but, you know, sitting around with them, telling them my aspirations in life, you know, I want to do nuclear physics. And, um, you know, one of the guys was like, yeah, you should do that. And I was like, fuck, this is not, this is not aligned with what it is. So right. I decided to turn it around, man. And um, just, uh, wow kind of happened naturally, I guess, but kind of pulling my head out of the clouds, thinking about life a little bit. So you went from trying to probably trying to fit in with a group of losers. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, but I, I get I, it. Though. I, I never tried to fit in. I, I didn't really, uh, actually, I, I, in high school, I talked to anybody and everybody. Um, you know, I, um, you know, I, I was never one to try to fit in. If anything, I'm a little bit antisocial. I sort of just always did what I wanted. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you. it followed the same pattern. And then, you know, I, I'm the same person I was when I was five years old, when I was 10 years old, when I was 15, 16, getting in trouble. Yeah. Um, I think we're always sort of the same people. We have that sort of inner child. I mean, that's us. So I haven't changed. Um, still the same. Uh, well, and, you know, you just learn along the way, sort of, uh, you got a, one life. It's a, it's a breath. And how do you want to live it? Um, got to make some choices. So I love that, man. So, so you, um, you went on, got, got a couple of bachelor's degrees. Um, did you graduate and go get a job in nuclear physics or? No, a lot of my friends, they graduated and went out and got jobs. Um, I mean, I, I was always much more interested in like, uh, science. And so for science and for research, you know, you should do, um, you know, more, more school. So I got a, uh, a master's degree, um, went to Paris, uh, 
because I had met uh, my to be wife uh, in Paris during a study abroad. Um, so I went over to do my uh, master's in biophotonics, a couple years there. Um, master's in what? Bio biophotonics. So like basically imaging with light. Okay. Light matter interactions, a lot of laser stuff, looking at cells. Um, I was Jeez. measuring action potentials with the laser. That was my, my master thesis. Wow. Okay. You might officially be the most intelligent person to ever be on this show. Um, so where did, so did, what do you do with that degree? I, I, I'm curious. What do you do with that? Uh, I mean, I was, I was trying to figure out how my, you know, love for physics can be used in, you know, healthcare basically in helping people. I didn't really think about it in terms of healthcare, but you know, cancer is bad. How do we, you know, cure cancer? Um, I love physics, you know, keep going, following my nose, uh, through things that I like and, and learning more. Um, so I switched from, you know, these sort of, uh, optical imaging technologies, which are really, um, only good for a millimeter of tissue to medical imaging technologies in my PhD. So I did a PhD in bioengineering in a, um, like a nano medicine laboratory. Uh, so that was sort of my next step. And where did you get your PhD? Yeah. So I was, uh, I was at Northeastern university. In okay. Boston. Did I read though, that you also were at Harvard? That's true. Yeah. So after that, I did a couple of years over there, um, the postdoctoral fellowship. Wow. Okay. So where did all of this education, um, lead you? Where did, where did it take you? Um, yeah, I mean, it's taking me now to a startup. So I have my own startup. Um, it's based on the technology that I invented during my PhD developed during my postdoctoral fellowship. So uh, I think it's pretty breakthrough. And then, you know, the comfortable path would have been to continue in academia. I mean, that's what everybody does. Uh, and um, it's funny, too, because, you know, it's even it was even frowned upon sort of to make a startup by academic people. I, you know, it's a uh, I mean, it's different. Uh, of course, now I feel like I feel like the the eyes of society kind of like it now. Right. So it's kind of a positive thing, but, um, it's a scary thing. You know, it's, uh, usually you just apply for grants and you make your own lab and you're just, uh, you know, working 80 hours a week, just grinding away, doing, you know, cleaning the floors for other people till you, till you make your way there. Right. So uh, yeah. academia is a, so yeah, I, I decided to take what I thought was a, a better path. And I think it worked out really well. Um, uh, been able to work with, uh, some of the best people in the world that are, believe it or not, you know, somewhere else, not always at Harvard. So once you're in a startup, you just choose where you go. So, you know, here, there and everywhere, UCSF, uh, University of Wisconsin, Madison, wherever the people are, you just find them and you work alongside them. So I think it's more practical. Um, I mean, we've got grant money. We wrote grants, did that. I think that's important. But then you also have, you know, other opportunities for funding and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, when you're trying to change people's lives, academia is cool, but it uh, feels a little bit, I mean, somebody has to get it out there, right? So, yeah. So what's, uh, <clears throat> for the lay person, i.e. me, um, what's a day in the life of Cody? I mean, what's that, What all of this sounds really like, Okay, I, I I'm I've been an entrepreneur for thirty years. I've never been granted anything. I, it's go out, knock on doors, and and ask for the sale. What what is it like for you in a startup? And what's the day in the like? What do you do like every breaking, day? Breaking through walls, breaking, <laughs> breaking through walls. That's it. Right. Uh, always a wall to break through. Um, you know, I think a lot of the things that are you know, difficult limiting, uh, after the science is sort of established and you've done a lot of stuff and things there, it's, uh, it's, it's business things, it's people, um, it's different types of walls that need to be broken down. Um, you know, so especially when you have something that's quite disruptive, you don't really fit into a cookie cutter. You know, most of the people who are, you know, have, the, you know, it's like a lot of entrepreneurs, they've got, 
you know, it's not really a zero to one technology that's really paradigm shifting. Um, they've got something incremental or they've got an app or they've jumped on like, uh, you know, the latest boat, um, waving the flag of AI or something like that. Like, yeah, we use AI too. It's not at the heart of what we do, but, um, so I've seen, uh, you know, seen a lot of different kinds of, um, uh, but I really like the most innovative stuff, right? I want to, I want to do something that really shakes things up and changes things. Which is what, what is like, you mentioned the curing cancer, um, which I just lost my, my, we lost my brother-in-law to cancer just recently. Sorry you know, what, that. what, what is, what is, uh, I mean, good Lord, I would give everything and my, my wife and her, they'd give everything for the cure to cancer, obviously. Right. Many people would, mm. what does that look like for you? What, how mm. are you disrupting and and changing the world with, with what you're, with your knowledge. I mean, you obviously have a lot of it. Yeah. There, there's a, there's a lot of really cool uh, advances out there for cancer, for, for other, you know, age related diseases, a lot of great things going on. Um, uh, what I've invented is a, is an imaging technology. Okay. So it works with any MRI scanner. Um, so for example, we, we could, uh, image a tumor, you know, it could be in a person or an animal, uh, deliver some kind of treatment and quantify how well that treatment's going in real time. Okay. Um, and so it's really a diagnostic technology for early detection and enhanced characterization of disease, but then also can be used to accelerate drug development. Uh, because, you know, a lot of the times it's just hard to see what's going on. Uh, and MRI is a amazing technology you can see inside the body. Uh, but most of the time, it's just these qualitative images. Uh, you're going to look at them with your eyeballs. Um, not much is going to come out of it by way of quantification. Uh, for tumor, for cancer, you know, they're looking at the size of the tumor. Does it get right. smaller? Um, a lot of times that tumor becomes necrotic. The treatment might be working, but it doesn't get smaller, right? So we quantify the vascular physiology. So we make these beautiful vascular images. They're 10x better than with gadolinium and then you know, that's the contrast agent that's typically used in MRI. And then, oh, by the way, we don't use gadolinium. Uh, we use an iron supplement. Uh, and then, you know, we quantify the vascular structure, function, and leakage. Uh, so the vascular density of the small vessels, you know, um, how well those vessels are functioning, um, looking at vasodilations, and then leakage. Um, wow. And yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good kind of holistic picture of any organ in that sense or any, yeah. That's just unbelievable to me. I like, I, I don't. So what is your, um, what's in, what, what are you, what are you hoping for that? What this all develops into? Yeah. I mean, you know, in, in some sense, it's like, if you've seen that movie Elysium, you know, with Matt Damon, yeah, they're, they're trying to get up there to that space station and they've got that machine in there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that that machine is doing two things, right? It's scanning your body. It's finding any disease and then it's sort of curing you. Right. And you see these cool pictures that it scanned you and so on. Yeah. So we're kind of the first part of that technology. You know, we scan the body. We look for disease, we identify it. Um, and so, you know, I'm passionate about early detection, delivering this technology to hospitals, whether it be for early detection of, you know, Alzheimer's disease and related dementia you know, other neurodegenerative disease, um, cancer, uh, detection is really critical characterization, but then also, you know, working alongside drug developers. Um, I think one of the most interesting drugs are cell therapy, right? And so, uh, you know, working alongside um, those people developing now important relationships, um, trying to work with the best and um, if successful, showing how well their drugs work because that's really the bottleneck for them. Uh, is that, you know, uh, the FDA needs to see a dose dependent response to how well these amazing uh, therapies are working, but there's not always, you know, one biomarker, you know, the person's right. healed, they're doing better, you know, everyone's feeling better. Um, a lot of antidotal type information, but, you know, wouldn't it be great if you had a brain map of the vascular physiology, you could see these things aren't quite that well, and then boom, it's better like a, like a healthy younger person, you know, or the disease is gone. So, it's the kind of quantification that I want to deliver to that. So <clears throat> with, with everything that you do, 
I mean, it sounds like you're dealing with a lot of people on a, a, a government level as well. I mean, you come up with, let's pretend that you have the cure to cancer. Like here it is. I have it. There's, there's an awful lot of red tape. I would imagine that, yeah. you, that you, you have to deal with to deliver said cure. That's right. I mean, and I don't have it. I mean, I think one of the, again, one of the most outstanding sort of innovators in this space is Dr. Bob Hariri at Cellularity, right? And, um, you know, it is hard to innovate here. Um, there's a lot of political games that are played. Um, yeah. I don't know if you look at their stock price, like it fell 95%, right? So now fortunately, 80% uh, of their company is owned by them and it's and it's and even of that 20 percent that's publicly available um you know they sort of own a lot of that too but what it means is it's difficult for them to raise large amount of money to bring cell therapy to people right all right so these kind of political games trying to take away the fuel and the energy uh that you know those colossal innovators need um you know so uh you know if, if, if we can help with our technology to show how well it works in a clear, clear way, like that dose dependent manifestation of what's happening in your brain and body, like that's, that's what this technology can do. That's what we can do. Let's do it. You know, um, I've heard, and I don't know much about it. I'm sure you know way more about it than I do, but I've heard that like Elon Musk is developed or trying to develop some kind of an implant what is that all about? Do you know much about that? Um, I know a little bit about that, um, but but not a whole lot. Um, okay. Yeah. It's not related to, to what you do in any way. I mean, it could be. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, is that trying to cure or just ameliorate the human condition? Um, I don't know. It's, it's not sort of the lowest hanging apple for us, is it? Um, Whereas, believe it or not, something like Alzheimer's disease might be because it's actually quite easy for us to measure early and characterize. So that's, you know, uh, but, but, you know, so, and we take it step by step, right? So um, yeah. right now, actually, what we're doing is just trying to get the imaging technology to market. So it's just those black and white images that are better and safer than the existing ones. So every year there's like 40 million MRI scans in the US, uh, 20 of them, 20 million of those use that, you know, toxic gadolinium as a contrast agent. Um, but then there are, you know, a million, millions of more scans that are actually not undergone, uh, because people have kidney disease. There's 37 million Americans with chronic kidney disease, um, beyond sort of the heavy metal toxicity properties of gadolinium. Like people are contraindicated to it if the kidneys aren't working, uh, too well. So, so we want to deliver this 10 X better and safer modality to them first. Um, eventually, you know, just to everybody, um, but then we can do some really neat things with it too. We can make, you know, full body vascular scans that you wouldn't be able to do um, with gadolinium because you have to inject it in, image right away, get these first past images. So we can map the whole body, um, the whole, um, so we can do some interesting things there. So yeah, we just, so it's a software, goes on the scanner, changes how it operates, like changes the operating system. It's not building on top of it. And then, you know, what other people are doing. So it's a little bit different as physics-based actually in quantum physics. Um, but yeah, come, comes across as a software, get it on there. Um, and then, uh, you know, the other part of the business model is to sell the, uh, the iron supplement. So that's what, <laughs> that's what we're planning. And actually, so then we'll deliver those black and white images. Yeah. Um, and, and then after that, I think that there are larger markets too, even, even larger now though, that's big, um, for those advanced diagnostics in those aging and related diseases. So is your primary um, customer, I guess, um, hospitals? Uh, yes. Okay. Essentially, yeah. And, and, and by, by approaching a hospital system um, that, I mean, what is the, the ultimate payoff for a hospital to, to do business with you? Um, so, you know, again, because we're targeting, you know, those people who can't get those life-saving scans, 
we're talking yeah. about, you know, life-saving diagnostics that otherwise would not be Got possible. It. I mean, when you talk about, okay, this image is 10x better and, you know, it's safer than gadolinium. They're like, well, we're using gadolinium every day, saving people's lives, we're doing fine. Okay, the images are 10x better, but what do we care? So I think kind of starting at a beachhead where it's like, hey, we have no solution for this. Yeah. You know? And, you know, they're actually paying for expensive nuclear imaging and all kinds of stuff um, that's not even delivering the information they need. So, you know, there's at least, you know, a million scans a year uh, that that are just needed that are not undergone. Um, that's that's insane. conservative. That's in, that's a lot of people. It's I mean, it people. is. Yeah, and more than that, I mean, you know, even if I had to get a, a scan, I, I wouldn't want one with gadolinium. I'd, I'd like our 10x better, you know, 10x more detail with an iron supplement uh, scan, right? So, um, wow. Yeah. And you don't get a choice now, do you? No, I mean that's all that there's on the market, right? Um, wow. Yeah. So you know what we have, it already works. Um, and you know the the walls we have to break through are more uh, business type walls. Uh, we found a pathway to FDA clearance now with our software, which was sort of uh, you know working with these MRI manufacturers. So that's sort of um, really critical for us. Um, there's a oh, question okay. Carrie put in there. Do you have any thoughts on that? Fasting as a way to kill cancer. Um, yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot of interesting uh, alternative type, uh, you know, ways to approach cancer. Like uh, Tony Robbins, who I'm a big fan of. He talks a lot about that. Love um, Tony. So I would just read up on him and what he has to say about it and the people he, uh, you know, uh, trust and believes in and what they have to say about that. That's what, that's what I would yeah. do. Dr. Yeah. Joe Dispenza has some interesting uh, stuff on it too. Yeah. Jim, Jim Miller asks, are you working on any autoimmunity diagnostics? So how, yeah. does, how does he even know to ask that question? Jim, how do you know that? Jeez. <laughs> He's a well, friend of mine. Sure. Wow. So, I mean, for example, like multiple sclerosis is a autoimmune disease, right? So your brain is attacking those axonal, you know, sheaths and, um, and then rebuilding them. Um, so yeah, our technology can work there. So you're going to have a uh, blood blood barrier leakage. So that's the kind of thing we can measure. You're going to have an increased vascular density. So structure, function and leakage. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it's very different to be able to make these measurements, uh, at the individual level. Some, some of these measurements, like people have done in like large group studies with gadolinium, for example. Yeah. Um, but to be able to just map that out at the individual level, that's sort of, you know, so, so yes, it, it definitely can work for um, autoimmune diseases. I and mean, we've mapped out and published about like type two diabetes, looking at blood brain barrier leakage um, going on there. Um, we've looked at, so some, some places you, you know, you might not expect. So. <clears throat> So I've had MRIs and I, I had no idea that they were putting this. Well, not every time. Yeah. I mean, if you got injected with something. I um, did. Then you got it. They said it's going to make you feel really warm inside and you're going to feel like peeing your pants. Yeah. So you felt warm inside. Um, is that what that way. is? The gas? What get? It's unfortunately what it is. Yeah. I mean, you know, and the toxicity of that, I mean, there's so many people that are getting right. So 20 million people a year are just getting it. Um, but it accumulates in the brain of every healthy person. You what? can still see the accumulation. Like it accumulates like linearly. Is there time. a half-life to it? To that accumulate? It's uncertain. Apparently it sticks around. What? Um, yeah. So. It, 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 okay. So, and this is a toxic substance. Yeah. Okay, so why are we allowing this? Well, I mean, there's not really much of an alternative, right? So again, those life-saving scans. So if, you know, if you if you need uh, until us, right? Um, but there is now, right? Now, yeah. Okay, so w w why are we not stomping on the gas and like every hospital in the freaking world going, Hey, we changed. We're, we're looking at two years and we are, uh, you know, raising funds to get the gas in the tank. So the, pl the plane is on the runway. Just needs some, okay. some gas in the tank. That's true. Well, what do we need? What do we, let me, I have a big audience, man. What do we need to tell them to help you? What do we do? <laughs> 
Well, I mean, if you're an accredited investor um, and, and, and you're interested in investing, you, know, you can reach out to me. Um, we're raising 5 million bucks. Um, we're working with, you know, some of the world's greatest people. Happy to tell you more. Um, yeah. Is there a website that people can? Yeah. So www.imaginostics.com. Hold on. I'm going to try to spell it. Imaginostics.com. I think I may have gotten it. Let's see. And you can find me on LinkedIn. It's, it's the only real social media I really use. Nobody uses LinkedIn as the problem, Cody. Everybody uses LinkedIn. What are you talking about, man? Is the... <laughs> I teach social media. I don't uh, even touch. I don't even touch LinkedIn. Uh-huh, right. um, anyway, it, is that right? Imaginostics.com? Um, imagine. Yep, that's it. Okay, good. Imaging plus diagnostics. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. Uh, bronchitis, man. It's terrible, man. It's terrible. Yeah, um, time for that. Well, you know what's worse than bronchitis is all the steroids I'm on. Yeah. I did not know I had this kind of appetite. Like, I want to eat, like, literally everything. I don't... I, it's crazy. Yeah. Um. So, this, you know, this is... Um, this is kind of, knowing that I've had some MRIs... Um, and I have more coming up because I have an aneurysm. Um, mm. I, it, it, it disturbs me that they're putting this toxic substance into my body yeah. and nobody's even saying, Hey, by the way, um, that warm, fuzzy feeling that you're going to get is, is actually a top toxic substance. What? I mean, there are those in the know, uh, you know, on the other hand though, I mean, the alternative for you with your aneurysm is a pretty, pretty bad, uh, right? You need it. You need to have the life-saving scans. So it's, you know, and it's, it's hard to say what the, what that can do to people long-term. I mean, we just found out in 2018 that this is happening, right? So it just got the black box warning. What? Um, so, and people have been using it for so long and then. But you find different schools of thought. You'll find like radiologists that are like, oh, no, this is this is awesome. We've been doing it forever. You know, they're usually like 80 years old and <laughs> telling you, you know, everything's awesome. But uh, a lot of people know now. I think a lot of people are sort of in the know. They realize it, see what it is. Um, it's but you great. can't go in and like go, no, don't inject me with that. I mean, if you if you've got it, if you got an aneurysm. I mean, I, I think, uh, I think you might need it to, so they can see that thing clearly. Right. I mean, it's just, it's a, again, it's sort of, um, can I not just say, call my buddy Cody and he'll bring some other stuff over another couple of years, another 5 million bucks in a couple of years. And, and we, you can call your buddy Cody and we'll help you out. Dude, that is crazy. That's I just, I'm sorry. I'm kind of lost for words. It's like, yeah, I've got, I mean, there, you know, there's a, there are some companies that are developing, for example, um, uh, different kinds of treatments for aneurysms, uh, that they stick like coils that they stick in the sack. Um, and they're interested in partnering with us now becoming clients, uh, just because actually we don't have, we can see the aneurysm. We can see the blood vessels. We don't have any, um, of these sort of what are called imaging artifacts. So usually when you have something metal in the body or some kind of you know, these stents and you know, these implants and these coils, they make signal drop out in these images. So it just gets black around it. So we don't have any of that going on. So we can see it quite clearly. Actually, we can image up to stainless steel, look at the mesh of these, you know, stents that go on the body. Um, the method is insensitive to that kind of susceptibility and do signal drop out. So, so that's actually another application is, uh, you know, uh, monitoring those devices and showing how, how they work too, actually. Wow. So you could, I mean, you could literally turn the medical world upside down. I think so. I think it's paradigm shifting. Yeah. Uh, because the vast, you know, being able to describe for the first time, the vascular physiology at the individual level and in a way that's not toxic. Um, I think that's pretty different and critical and it can work on any MRI scanner and they're everywhere. Right. So, so there's, but I mean, and this is different than like x-ray technology, right? That's yeah, completely different. Yeah. MRIs don't have any inherent toxicity apart from 
the contrasts that are typically used. Yeah, they're completely safe. Wow. Um, pretend for a moment that you've got all 8 billion people listening to you right now on the planet. What what do you what do you have to say? What what is it that you want the world to know about Cody and and your vision for the future for our world and and healthcare technology overall? Uh, I'm gonna I mean, give you full screen. Go, <laughs> come on. I don't know about all that, but um, yeah. I mean, my vision for healthcare. I mean, I think we're. I mean, we're we're, we're in an incredible time, right? We have this uh, with AI. It's accelerating everything. Uh, we're, you know, if you read the the book, the future is uh, faster than you think. I've got it back there. I mean, by Peter Diamandis. Um, it's it's an it's an exponential time. Things are happening really fast. Right? So fast. Um, and you know, my part of it is is I I want to be a part of that exponential, uh, you know, happening and accelerate these drugs that are being developed. Right. That's what I'm most passionate about. Yeah, I care a lot about early detection and diagnosis. Uh, I'm a physicist and believe it or not, I care more about healing people. So, you know, I think that, you know, a diagnostic is a necessary, but not sufficient sort of step towards that. So, um, I would say have hope because there's a lot of critical, um, therapies that are coming, you know, they say you're going to live, uh, you know, like you're like you're 50 until you're 122, you know? So, um, I think that's going to happen and hopefully we can help, right. We can, we can help with that bottleneck where, you know, you got to demonstrate clearly, for example, to the FDA that things are working, um, you know, because you have these giant studies. It costs so many billions of dollars. You need so many people because you can barely see what's going on. Um, so being able to show it at the individual level drives the cost down and really quantify what's going on and then make things quite clear. Um, I, ha I'm, I'm, I have a friend, Dr. John um, Jakewish, who has... I don't know, million and a half followers on Instagram. He's probably not on LinkedIn either. I'm just kidding. Um, that's a joke. You're supposed to laugh. Anyway. I'm laughing um, now. I got you. I cue the laugh sign. Oh, there it is. And the applause sign. Uh, I see it now. I got you. Got that's you, man. funny. Um, but he, you know, he was funny. He's a PhD. And he said, um, I said, I forget what we were talking about, but I said something about, yeah, but an MD told me this. He goes, we teach the MDs. <laughs> I said, oh, you know. It was so yeah. funny. But I, you know, I think I look, I look at what you're talking about and, 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 you know, my, my sister's a, a, a nurse practitioner. I, I know a lot of physicians, but they're, they're called medical practices for a reason. Like they're, there's nothing, well, I shouldn't say nothing, but they're, it's, they're practicing and every, every body, human body is different. It's going to react in a different way to certain things, right? Am I wrong about that? I mean, there's going to be some variances there. So to put everything inside of one box seems irresponsible. What me. do you mean by that, though? Put everything in a box. Meaning please. like, hey, you've got bronchitis and he's got bronchitis and we're going to treat both of you the exact same way. I mean, may maybe for bronchitis, that's uh, less sensitive than than other diseases or you know maladies. But yeah, I, I, I just I, I look, I watched my brother in law go through a 44 year battle with cancer. And, and from six years old until he was 50 and, and, and he went through so much chemo and radiation that it literally caused blindness. It caused all kinds of, it's the, those things that they're, they're, they're treating cancer with are literally poison that cause other problems. And, and it sounds to me that you're trying to flip the script on that, so to speak. Yeah. And, you know, the way I look at it is, you know, I kind of look around, I'm like, you know, what's the most innovative technology out there? Oh, this, this guy's got something amazing. You know, let's go accelerate that kind of yeah. thing. Right. So, and there are some amazing technologies out there. Yeah. And yeah. Cell therapy can do so much, right. It covers like, you know, it can be used for cancer too, you know, and 
can you can be used to recover from those you know uh, chemotherapies and, let me ask you i don't know if i should even ask this you may not want to answer this um and don't if you don't want to just say i don't want to answer that okay um you know, I, I've heard a lot of things about big pharma, um, bad, nefarious things, in fact, that, that they hide some truths about stuff because it affects their stock prices and, and other things. Um, do, do you think there's any truth to any of that? I don't know. I mean, I think you know, big pharma is not going to be like the earliest adopter of our technology either. Right. Like they're not, really? they're not all that innovative. I mean, they're just these big corporations, right? Whoever had the original dream, like who knows who that is and he's gone. Um, right now, depending on who the big pharma is, some of these guys can be a little bit innovative and, um, you right. know, so yeah. So I, I wouldn't put everybody in a bucket. Um, some of okay. these big pharma, you know, there's one right now we're, we're going to be talking with some people about precision uh, medicine for cancer and they've got drugs and they, they do want to see how they're working and they've got a combination of drugs and they want to be able to monitor that. Yeah, they're, they're a big old pharma player and they, they're interested in talking to them. Um, so I've, I've kind of seen a lot of different things. There's a couple of really big pharma companies right now that are like your classic big pharma that are actually interested in our technology and using it. Um, but, but eventually, you know, I think, I think everybody might be, but yeah, they're, I think they're just slower to move, yeah. um, which, which you would expect that they have all this money and they're going to be, you know, but it's, it's not what you would think. It's, it's no, not, unfortunately. Jim has a great question. In what ways are you supporting the growing number of functional medicine practitioners? I think um, there's some, some, I think personally, this is just my opinion. There's a lot of really good stuff happening in functional medicine. Yeah. And even, even, um, you know, non sort of medicinal interventions or whatever. Right. Um, so, you know, I think, I think the kind of thing that's there, I think that, you know, also goes along the lines of, of just like looking at like the, the general health of the body, something like what fountain life is doing another, you know, again, I'm a huge fan of Tony Robbins. So I'm going to be following, you know, his companies and actually yeah. we're in Lake Nona, Orlando, Florida to, you know, to serve fountain life is what we, what we want to do. So once we're FDA cleared and approved, you know, full body vascular scans, is sort of, sort of, you know, why we're here. Um, wow. But, you know, and people want to know the biological age of their body and, yeah. you know, they want, and, you know, we can deliver, for example, the biological age of each organ, but also um, quantify the, the health of the organ. Right. Um, there's gotta be some, you know, normal, healthy, vascular physiology for each organ, um, for adults, and that's going to decline over time. So whatever the medicine or intervention, um, you know, if you can quantify the health of that organ or tissue, uh, you're going to be able to help. So I think in that general broad sense, I think we sort of apply again, sort of everywhere. Yeah. Wow. So you're, you're doing, a, are you, you're like really doing a, not a lot with Tony, but you're, you're definitely following a lot of what Tony Robbins is, is doing. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, in his book, Life Force, he's really identified some of the key players and some of the key technologies. Um, wow. And, and so that's, that's why, you know, um, so, you know, there's a strong community there of people who are, you know, and so again, it's a supportive technology, right? Diagnostics sure. is always the support. Um, I think so um you know where can we help kind of thing wow cody you are um exceptionally smart i mean you 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 just i i love the way your brain works um anything else you'd like to share with the audience today um i mean so you know there's a it's a platform technology so we can help in 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 so many different diseases and um you know, we've done a, a lot of work to do proof of principle in, in many cases, especially in animal models. Um, and, and right now we're focused on, you know, going to market with just the black and white vascular imaging solution to next better, especially for those who can't get it, but hopefully for everybody and then full body vascular scans. Um, in parallel, we're also looking at early detection of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. And that's thanks to about, you know, total of like 
six million dollars from the National Institute on Aging and the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. So, you know, the thing that it takes to move this technology at this point is just energy. So, you know, I, I'm passionate about curing, you know, any age related disease or any of these uh, spaces could, could be of great interest to me, right? So, but but where where's sort of the the energy and the tanks for those things? So um, if people are interested in particular diseases and uh, would like to see those things, I mean, I work with the world's best clinicians at the world's best research hospitals. And um, we apply to grants, we're applying to, to grants in traumatic brain injury, University of Pennsylvania, uh, wow. you know, crew at Memorial Sloan Kettering for brain cancer, um, you know, uh, even for multiple sclerosis with, uh, you know, some of the crew that I'm working with in Alzheimer's disease related dementia, at University of Miami. Um, so if there are, you know, potential benefactors out there um, who would like to see some accelerated developments in these spaces, uh, let's talk, you know, so. I have, uh, you know, I have a client. I don't know if she's watching or not. Dr. Laura that um, like she owns the Dementia Care Academy. She works a lot in dementia all over the U.S. It, it, and that's a huge growing problem. And I've I've seen. I don't know if I I can't really say I've read reports on it because I I haven't. Um but that, you know, dementia has a lot to do with what's going in the body as well that, that, that can trigger dementia later. And it's like, wow, the, the stuff that we're just not aware of. Well, I mean, if, if you're lucky enough to get to a, a ripe old age and, and die of it, I mean, one in three people are going to die with dementia. So it's, oh it's, it's one of those things where it's like we're going to die because one of our organs are going to fail um is the brain going to be one of those organs so it's not sort of a matter of if but when and then yes you know the environmental factors you know definitely uh can make that worse or even genetic factors make that worse or better um you know so and the type of i mean we we looked at a you know the single most genetic uh the single most significant genetic risk factor for alzheimer's is apoe4 um so we looked at a, a model of that where we put that human gene into uh, rats and we followed their lifespan. Um, and we found that we could measure it, you know, in the earliest time point we did in that study was 20 year old human equivalent. And we could see it like night and day at the individual animal. So imagine being able to see those things at like 20 year old human equivalent. So, I mean, that's sort wow. of, that's sort of, you know, what excites me about this technology. It's just the, you know, just data driven, you know, new data. Uh, so, but with your, you, you know, we're talking about imaging and diagnostics and, but like, so let's pretend for a moment that you can use your technology and detect dementia in a 20 year old. That's going to happen when they're 78. I'm throwing out completely obscure numbers, but sure. the, how how does I, 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 want, I, I need to make sure I word this question right so it makes what sense. do you do about it? <laughs> like, no, how does do do? identifying the potential problem help the problem? Yeah, I mean, that, you know, as you kind of touched on, I mean, it's surprising how much lifestyle interventions can really curtail these sort of uh, diseases. You know, uh, if you're um, doing your, you know, daily cardio, uh, you are, you know, not taking in sugars, you're getting your sleep on time, all the things that you think, you know, mama would tell you to do, um, which, uh, which is funny because Peter Diamandis has this, uh, book now that's like Peter's longevity practices or something. When I read it, it was like, like my mom's just telling me like the normal shit that I already fucking know about. Right. Uh, but it's true. If you do those things, you really can combat um, these diseases. And then if you're, you know, if you find out you have a propensity to have it, I mean, maybe that's what you can do. Uh, what I'm interested in though, is not just identifying it, but then partnering with uh, whoever has the greatest drug against it. Mm. And then just showing that it works. Let's accelerate that. Can you, know? you can your technology be used in mm -hmm. the development of new drugs and treatments? Yeah. And, you know, there's, 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 there's a lot of exciting work about how AI can be used to identify, you know, new drugs, right? Um, I've seen companies 
anywhere from identifying existing drugs that were kind of fringe that were forgotten and now they're using AI to pick up, pick them up the good ones, you know, yeah. uh, to companies that are just, you know, you know, designing brand new drugs using, you know, AI. Uh, and, and wow. that's awesome. And so, but then that brings us to, you know, to the next thing is how do you show, how do you, how, from those, how do you bring them to the next step? So that, that's a place again, where we can accelerate things, you know, a small group of animals, um, you know, we can, for example, give you reason to believe that this thing should be brought to humans, right? And then hopefully in a small group of humans, show you that this thing is really working or not. Um, so, yeah, I think that's powerful. Wow. Some crazy stuff happening, man. And, and I don't mean crazy in a bad way. I mean, in a good way. It's, it's, this is, um, it's what an exciting time to be alive, quite frankly, because there's guys like you out there behind the scenes that nobody even knows about coming up with this stuff. And there's, there's a, it's a very exciting time to be alive. I think, I think uh, if we can hang on for another 10, 15 years, I, you know, they talk about this longevity escape philosophy. They talk about, you know, but there really are uh, treatments and therapies that are, that are coming. Um, and uh, I think if you can hold on for another 10, 15, you might be feeling a whole lot better, uh, whatever it is. So what do you, but is there, is there a, is there a, um, a, 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 a crossroads where we we've overdeveloped or we, we, um, I don't know. It's like, what's that, 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 that movie where, the computer starts attacking the world and, and then it, it, in the end, it's like, Oh, this is a war a games no, or whatever. Yeah. War games. Yeah. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Like, is it, it no is win a, scenario. Yeah. Is there a point though, where we go, man, we've gone, I mean, Elon talks about it, you know, that, that AI could be the end of the human race. If we, if we let it go too far, you know, nuclear bombs could be the end of the human race. If you right. Like that's true. So it's a, uh, you know, and I mean, these, these models, um, you know, I think it's which humans, you know, how you use them responsibly. I think it's another potential danger, another potential lifesaver. Um, you know, so I think again, it's just people uh, who are uh, key there. I, I don't think, I don't think AI is evil or inherently it's just a tool. You know, that's uh, it. I but um, in, in terms of, you know, over developing, I think, you know, I think um, I think I think there's a waste of resources. I think a lot of uh, resources have conventionally been poured into areas that um, like, for example, in Alzheimer's disease. I don't know how much money was spent for anti amyloid drugs. Right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, thanks to imaging, actually, you could see that the amyloid was in the brain. Right. So you had positron emission tomography. Uh, the first uh, investor in that really was the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. And thanks to that, we now have anti amyloid you know, therapy, those monoclonal antibodies. Um, it can slow down the rate of cognitive impairment by as much as about 35 percent. That's great. Wow. Cool. Does it reverse? Does it really you know how? And so but now we know like, great, so let's move on. So I think people now are like, great, we've done that. We poured all these resources into that. Some of these big pharmaceutical giants are trying to, you know, fine tune that. Um, one of the things we could actually probably do there is identify people who are going to, uh, because the, the problem with that is the vascular related side effects. So yeah. I think we could identify people who are going to have those vascular related side effects. Um, I think there's stuff to be done there too. Like, you know, I think, I think cleaning the amyloid from the blood, nobody's talking about it. Right. But when you take all this amyloid out of the brain, you throw it into the blood and, you know, it stays there for like months and months and months a year. There was this study that my buddy published about ponzumab, which was used in cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Um, it was a Pfizer drug and they canned it because uh, their output was the vascular reactivity. So the vessel responsiveness and it, it actually went down. They didn't respond as good anymore. They're like, oh, this isn't working. Um, but you know, in retrospect, what else would you expect? Cause you're, you know, they're measuring the amp blood amyloid. You're filling up the blood with, you know, amyloid oligomers. Uh, these people probably have blood brain barrier leakage, certainly in mild cognitive impairment or in dementia, they do. And so you're throwing this out of the brain into the blood. It's leaking and backing into the brain, um, causing constriction of capillaries, reduced blood flow. Nobody's talking about cleaning it out. 
Um, I think that would be critical. I mean, I think that would help. Um, but, uh, you know, but the, the point is, is that I think, you know, those resources were poured so long into this thing because it's 1909 or whenever it was, you know, they saw this shit in people's brains, right? Like, great. Right. So, but, but now we're moving on. So I think, I think allocation of resources in a new spaces is, is uh, pretty cool. Um, actually, alongside amyloid and tau, now vascular features are uh, in the usual suspects of the uh, pathology. I mean, it's been put into the criteria. So it's actually the earliest vascular features are, are now known to be the earliest and most significant uh, throughout the whole process. Which is pretty cool. I mean, you just mentioned 1909. Like we're still using <laughs> technology from 1909. What? Well, it's because you know it's when they first started looking at Alzheimer's, right? They cut open the brains. They saw the amyloid. They saw the tau. They they said, "Aha, the amyloid is causing the disease." Aha, tau. And they're like, "No, it's not tau. It's amyloid." And you had people arguing about it, but it's just a uh, you know, just you know, there's garbage in the street and there's all kinds of animals running about. But what's the real problem? Yeah. So, wow. so but, but, you know, again, fortunately the field is done what it could there and it's like moving on and allocating resources into other areas. I think there's a lot of hope even, even for that in terms of, uh, you know, historically people have just burned money when it comes to pouring money into these important diseases. Well, it's a good thing. Our government doesn't burn money today. I think the NIH does an outstanding job actually. And they're, really? they're underfunded. Yeah. 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 We need way more. All the innovation in the country, you know, <laughs> that, that these big companies will eventually eat up comes out of academia. And, yeah, um, right. And so, you know, but it, but it's underfunded and it's, it's a little bit, um, dysfunctional, you know, publish or perish studies can't even be repeated. Yeah. You know, it's, it's dysfunctional as well. So it's not perfect, but NIH does a, I think a pretty outstanding job. Um, so wow, with the resources they have, Cody, I, I I tried to keep up. This might be the most intelligent conversation I've had in a long time, um, and I know I did not I did not keep up at your level. But y you know, you you are gosh, you got a lot going on up there in that brain of yours. It's incredible. We, the world needs what you know. We're trying. <laughs> We're trying. <Yeah. laughs> you know, so well, hey, if you're if you're working with Tony Robbins and 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 you know, following his stuff and you know, sounds like you're on a, a good and you were referred to me by Justin Breen, who I I refer to him as Rain Man. Um and he laughs. I'm like, we, dude, we, you're... I would laugh too. We have a similar like antisocial I know personality you do. profile. Oh, actually. you do. It's funny because it's like it's all it's all weirdly shaped whatever that test was, and they just fit like right on top of each other. So it's like, yeah, you guys yeah. are kind of like almost the exact same person. Um, so <laughs> he's the journalist so, version, I, and I love that dude. He's freaking awesome. He's, he is. Yeah. Yeah. I I said to him one time. I said, "What do you do when a client asks you?" Um, how much you are. He goes, I hang up on them. <laughs> I go, what? He says, That's... humans. He hangs it yeah, up. bye. Anyway, bye. Um, so listen, man, you are, um, thank, I, I'm grateful. Thank you for coming on and, and sharing this. Jim Miller has a question. I don't know if you saw it, and I don't know what that even means. In your opinion, how effective is Viome.com's tech? Never heard of it. I, what is Viome.com? I've I've not heard of it. I, if I don't had know. Three and a half minutes, I could check it out, but yeah, I don't. for another time. Send me a message on um, you know, LinkedIn or LinkedIn. Yeah, we'll hit it. him up on LinkedIn. Yeah. He uses LinkedIn. Um, him and Justin. I know Justin does too. So, but anyway, listen, I um, I, I really do appreciate the conversation today. Um, man, you've had an interesting an interesting path. I, I think for somebody that in high school got, got um, suspended for an entire year and went on to earn a PhD and, and study at Harvard and, and everywhere else you've been. Wow, dude, I'd say you kind of pulled it all together 
and and you're um you're heading down a really cool path so um anybody watching if you think there's a way that you can help cody and 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 help the cause of getting the the toxic crap out of our bodies that they're injecting when they do an MRI. He has a solution that's non-toxic. Makes yeah. a whole lot more sense to me. Um, so, so get in touch with Cody on LinkedIn or go to imaginostics.com. Yeah, my, my email is also just Cody at imaginostics.com. If you want to, email there you me. go. Cody C O D I at imaginostics.com. So check it out. If you're listening on the podcast networks, make sure you check that out. Go over to the website and check it out. Cody, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you coming on today. It's my pleasure, man. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Breaking down walls. That's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, that's it. We had some breakthroughs today. Yeah. Everybody watching, share this out. Appreciate you all. Have a great weekend and stay with me, Cody. I'm going to end this, sure. but stay with me. I'll be right back. See you guys later. Have a great weekend.